Hello everyone, I'm Captain Foley. And as always, I mean always, I'm Connor Coggins. And we welcome you back to your home away from home, the Trek Yards universe. Come on, admit it. Some of you have Trek Yardians stamped on your passports as your primary citizenship. <laughs> but seriously, we have a bit with us a very special guest for you today, uh, Mr. John Ease, everyone. Welcome back to the show, John. Howdy, howdy. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Today we are, we'll be looking at a great ship and learning about its design origins and de design philosophy from the man that created her. I'm of course referring to the very popular Enterprise E, or the Sovereign class as first seen in the feature film, Star Trek First Contact. So let's suit up and make it so. Yeah, so like you said, the first time we saw it was in First Contact, you know, during that epic battle sequence of Sector 001. Uh, in Generations, you know, we saw the demise of the Great Galaxy class, or the Enterprise D, which many people had called home for so many years while watching TNG. So can you tell us, you know, what point you knew you were going to be designing this next ship, you know, the next ship to, you know, have the name Enterprise, and, you know, what made you, you know, what, what were you feeling when you knew that you'd be bringing another ship to this legacy? Um, it was it was an interesting thing, because I've worked in the model shop uh, ages before I started in the art department, and when we built the Enterprise D, it was uh, designed for TV format, that's why it's shorter. And the same thing with uh, uh, Battlestar Galactica. They made the stars much brighter because they felt it wouldn't show, you know. So uh, when we went to the motion picture of Generations, uh, they had to do a lot of work to make that D fit the widescreen view. And uh, making the model, it was it, it seemed that it was kind of um, had great views from the front and the back and, front, and when it would arch through. But from the side, it, it kind of had a, a kind of a, a, a balance issue. Um, and uh, it always looked kind of front heavy, so it, uh, that's why they'd always have it kind of flying over the camera and stuff. And I always thought, boy, if I ever had a chance to do an Enterprise, what would I do with it? And I always loved the Matt Jeffries one. And uh, after generations, I went back to the model shop, and then Herman Zimmerman called to come back to Deep Space Nine. They had an opening, Jim Martin had moved on. And so uh, I got in there, I think I did maybe four episodes of Deep Space Nine, and then Herman goes, we're going to do First Contact, and we're going to need a new Enterprise, so if you want to start sketching... And he walked away, and that was basically it. It's like, sure, I'll do it. And then, uh, then it hit like the gravity of, of what that was. And uh, I don't know. I was in shock for quite a while. I think, oh boy, because the Enterprise B was a great fun thing to do, and never thought I'd get the opportunity to make another one. And um, so that's kind of how it started. And uh, just that little brief ten-second conversation at my desk. So one of the first things I think about when I hear this ship mentioned is this six-foot studio model that was built. It must have been a very impressive sight. But soon after it was built, the CGI model was constructed to replace it. Uh, so can you please tell us a little about the process that was involved going from initial concept to physical model and then to CGI and why those decisions were made? And also, for the audience, just let us know which shots maybe use the physical model so that we can go back and see how much better it is than CG. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, what uh, uh, happened, this is actually the, the Enterprise E is the last actual physical miniature built for uh, Star Trek. It was right on the edge of the of the CG world. And uh, I knew all the guys up at ILM from uh, other shows. And I knew John Goodson would be one of the model makers in charge of uh, putting that ship together. And so uh, doing a lot of the artwork, it took quite a few sketches to get uh, an approved idea. And uh, I was kind of leaning more towards the D with the shorter nacelles. And uh, I, uh, I rotated the saucer to give it a more aggressive kind of feel. And the whole idea behind the E is that it was a battleship. It wasn't a, a science exploration ship. And I think that caused a lot of issue because that was something that was in-house news. Yet uh, to the general public when they saw the movie, it's like, hey, this is a completely different kind of concept for what an enterprise is going to be. And uh, after time and the Internet, you know, all that kind of paved the way. But um, doing the original sketches, uh, would send them up to ILM and Bill George and John Goodson would go over them. John Knoll was a part of that team. And uh, they kind of decided what size this model was going to have to be. And so they figured out about 11, 12 feet that because of all the, the scrutiny of the close shots and stuff. And the bigger model, the closer you can get. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we got to the point where we had to make a study model just to help out with some angles because the artwork can only goes so far and having a physical model you can turn around you can hire a lot of problems so um i actually have one in the garage i'll, I'll bring it in and show you the study model we we built for it and um that study model actually wound up being the gold plated model in the in the uh, observation lounge so it lived a double purpose and we actually had it on the set as well but but that whole process was kind of going back and forth with ilm and making sure the size would work out in that type of scenario so together we kind of collaborated on the whole process 
Ken, what time, at what point was the decision made to go to CG? And was that just for cost or for, was that for detail? Uh, CG was an issue because uh, uh, when they had built the model, they, uh, they had uh, tried a whole bunch of new processes on it, model making wise. They cast it out of clear material uh, originally. And uh, they were going to do this little um, kind of excerpt where they were going to, uh, instead of just having frosted windows, they were actually going to put slides. They took slides of the Enterprise D of all the sets and uh, put them on uh -huh. a back of microscope slide actually behind the window. So it would have it a little bit of a 3D when the camera would go by. So you'd look like there's a real set in there. They wanted to get that tight on the ship. And uh, for some reason, that clear material was always tacky. So every time they pull out of the mold, it was sticky. And they couldn't really get around that issue. And uh, it was killing a lot of their time while they were trying to make this model. So at the same time, they're going, we might have to do a CG model to make up the differences. And so in the long run, they wound up making a, a traditional model out of the normal material, cutting each window out, putting the slides in. And uh, then they had an issue with the paint. The paint wasn't coming out as, like the way they wanted it. So when they'd peel the, uh, they'd uh, layer it with uh, kind of tape and stickers and stuff, spray a coat and then peel that out and it would give you the multiple levels. And it wasn't holding up to the scrutiny that they wanted. So uh, a lot of the distant shots are these, like in the nebula, that's the, mini the physical miniature. When you're on the tight stuff, you're getting into the CG world. So they kind of crisscross in that battle uh, with the Borg cube and the Borg sphere. That's kind of a mixture of both uh, CG and the physical miniature. So it goes that way throughout the entire movie. But the very first scene we see with it in the nebula is the physical model. So the first time we see the ship is the physical model. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. You have a couple of shots where you're panning across the, the, the back of it. When it's doing the orbit around the Earth, that's the physical miniature. And, uh, oh, cool. So it really was just bad luck then that the E didn't continue being a, a, a physical. Do you think if it had gone ultra smooth and, and you know everything had gone out of the hitch, do you think they would have actually used the physical for all three movies and stuck with that? Or do you think the moved CG was inevitable? Oh, yeah, it certainly was, because it was the same with the TV shows. To make a miniature for, like, say, Deep Space Nine, it was a big deal because you had to have a miniature drawn up, you had to have it built, then you had to do motion control. It was all a big, giant process. And that's why you don't see that many new ships in, in Deep Space Nine. Voyager kind of crossed the line where they started to go CG in the middle, so you'll start to see more vessels and more ships. And with Enterprise, we were averaging sometimes five new ships a show just because it was an easier process. But in the movies, um, it was just, just the, the trend to go, and a lot of the effects houses were starting to close up that had motion control. ILM still, of course, had it, but... Uh, Apogee was kind of going out, uh, Boss is gone. So all the big places that could do that kind of stuff, the only one left was Image G, and they did most of the Star Trek work to begin with. They were a smaller house. They couldn't handle a motion picture size miniature because their blue screen was kind of small, But um, so they'd have to go out. But um, just with the times, it went CG, and that's kind of the way it went. Santa Barbara FX did uh, uh, Insurrection, and uh, they had a hard time because they were mostly environments, an environment kind of, effects house, so the new planets and nebulas and all that stuff. So getting the physical models was a great big challenge for them. Yeah. I have to ask, where is the six foot model now? What happened to it? The six foot, it was actually 11 foot. Oh, 11 foot, sorry. Yeah, um, they uh, they went between six and 11 with the larger scale. And uh, uh, it sold at uh, the Christie's auction and a gentleman that had uh, restored the uh, space shuttle, the Galileo. Actually, has that in his collection. So oh, excellent! Nice. He had it completely restored and uh, pretty fantastic. So model. it's in good hands then, which is awesome. Yeah, he is a brilliant collector of this stuff. So great, great, very great, great uh, guy to have all the stuff. So you know the uh, scene in Nemesis where the, he smashes into the scimitar. How much more difficult would that have been with a physical model? Uh, the whole uh, crash sequence was miniature. They made a giant saucer and a giant scimitar front end. Okay. And uh, <laughs> they collided them together. So a lot of a lot of. Uh, Brass work and plaster and stuff. So when it would hit, and they'd film it, so gravity would work to their advantage. So the pieces would fall down instead of fall and fall. That's incredible. On way. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so this was a much sleeker looking ship than the Galaxy class, and obviously designed with a more militaristic feel. As you know, it was designed to fight the Borg after all. And um, can you tell us what instructions you would get and what directions when designing the ship? You know, what influenced you the most? Um, you know, to give it such a dramatic departure from the Galaxy class. You know, we'd seen that design for so many years, and and and. and well, at the end of it, how did you think fans would react to such a radical change? Um, just in the design process, Herman Zimmerman was uh, the designer. And so uh, we would sit and would talk about things. And uh, we'd, we'd just kind of go, what do you think, Herman, since it's a battleship, what, what do you say we lose the neck? Because uh, 
you know, in Wrath of Khan, it's a vulnerable place. A couple more hits, and that would have been separated. And uh, so I go, if we make it sleeker, it makes it a more narrow, harder target to hit. And uh, so that's why it got really kind of compacted as, as, as opposed to being a taller taller vessel as, as a, in the, the profile sense. Um, so we, we kind of went back and forth on what to do. The shorter nacelles weren't working. And about that time, um, I think it's the, uh, oh, it's one of, one of the X-planes, and it had a, a swept wing format. We thought, let's give that a try on the stretch to maybe try something different. And uh, we're doing a whole bunch of process with that, the drawings, and Rick Berman kind of liked that idea. And one of the one of the gentlemen in the art department, uh, Fritz Zim and Herman's son, looked at it and goes, hey, it looks like a turkey in a pan. And it just cursed it from the top view. So he goes, yeah, it looks like a turkey with those forward struts and the engine. So we went with a more uh, kind of aggressive uh, reverse view of that. And it, it needed it. So um, it, as much as the, the forward struts was kind of a, a new idea, it just didn't work. So. What were, the, what were some of the initial words, maybe, that, that they said to you? You know, these are the key words that must be included in the design that you first heard. Uh, it had to be, uh, like we discussed, it was going to be a battleship. Um, not really a lot of uh, dialogue on which way it was going to go. Uh, Herman usually lets people in the art department run a course, and then he starts adding notes to them. Oh, I like that, or I hate this. And so... Um, the notes would kind of come as the drawings and the sketches were going. So initially it just said New Enterprise, and uh, at one point it was going to be a D class, or the Galaxy class, and they were just going to change the, uh, the letter to an E instead of a D. And it's all, it was all about budget at that time, and uh, Star Trek did not have a big budget. They split the art department between the TV shows and the movies, so we just moved from one to the other and split the day. And so uh, the budgets were not anything like they are now. And so uh, anytime they could save money on a model was a good deal. But looking at it, they had a big decision. No, let's not go with that. Let's make a new ship. And so they put their efforts into that. But like I said, there was really no distinctive words or terms that we used to make this ship. It was just some sketches, and then the, then the notes started to follow. That's cool. uh, one, one of the most notable changes to this design evolution is the connecting dorsal, or the neck, if you will, of the ship. The E basically has no neck. Now, I personally think it's a great look, and it makes the ship feel much more battle-ready. Um, can you talk a little bit about that particular design choice, yeah. and how have fans expressed themselves to you about that? Is it very positive, or what you, what's your um, experience been with the fans? Uh, it was funny when I was doing that. I didn't know computers or the Internet at all, and so uh, Mike Akuda <laughs> sitting behind me uh, when the ship came out in the movie. He'd come out and go, boy, people are 50-50 on this. They really, really hate it. Are they, are they really, really liked it? There's kind of no in between the ground. But um, we were thinking more, more story-wise when we were doing that design. And I loved the Excelsior, one of my favorite ships, even though it wasn't an Enterprise at the time. And I loved that sweep that it had right on the front there. And I thought, you know, if I just drop, lose that neck and drop the saucer onto the body, that might, uh, there you go, two versions, might take care of uh, the issue of, of it being attacked or being a, a point of attack. So. Mm. That's why we made the struts lower, made them big and thick, and, and all that stuff is just basically to vend off any type of attack that would separate parts of the ship. Excellent. And out of the other Federation ships you'd seen, what do you think were the main influences that you actually had taken maybe little elements from? Uh, mostly Matt Jeffries. I kind of combined Matt Jeffries' aesthetics with uh, with what Bill George had done with the Excelsior there, and I just did a big merge of the two with my favorite elements. And going back to the longer nacelles was a real treat. And uh, we just gave uh, Mr. Berman a couple of views to look at. We just put a, a, a note on it and say, this balances fairly well. And he goes, yeah, I think so. And so he was he was pretty much behind all the sketches as we went. And um, his feedback would go through Herman, and Herman would give me notes. And so Herman would kind of take uh, what uh, Mr. Berman would say and kind of uh, paraphrase it to what he was thinking and, or what he thought Mr. Burns wanted. So it all worked out pretty good. So there's one detail that I think a lot of us have wondered. Now, we never saw it on screen and it might not have been intended to be on the screen, but but talk us through it. Was the ship originally intended to source separate like the D? Was it ever considered to do it in the movies or was it something you had to add later on because the fans really wanted to see it? Or was it something you definitely had in mind the whole time? Um, we drew it with a saucer separation, which was always designed that way, because all the Enterprises up to that point had that feature. And uh, at one tiny moment, it was discussed that it was going to happen in first contact. 
and they decided it was too much to do. It was going to be basically the crew escaped on the saucer while the board were in the body. And they thought with the Phoenix going on and the battle with, De with Zeta and the board queen and all that was just too much. So uh, they pulled that whole scene out. But it was designed to separate. Uh, the same thing was originally going to be uh, penciled in with Nemesis and it didn't work out. So never got to see the two except in one whole unit. Uh, one thing that has always intrigued me is that the Enterprise uh, was changed or refitted for each TNG movie. <laughs> uh, the length was subtly altered and new de details were added when the script called for them. Now, do you want to talk us through some of those changes and why they occurred and if you were part of the process each time with that? Yeah, uh, originally with first contact, ILM makes a scale chart and everything. We, we go through this entire chart and make the scales for everything and they do whatever they can to make that that fly together. So everything in, in one shot will have the exact same scale. When it went to insurrection, um, we uh, didn't have necessarily a main effect supervisor. So we had one of the gentlemen from uh, Deep Place Nine working on it. And um, he didn't really particularly care about scale. He wanted the shots to look the best. And uh, he didn't think it was that important to, to keep that kind of uh, uh, size comparison together. So when you see it flying alongside the collector, it goes anywhere from a ship that's maybe mm, 3,500 feet to a couple miles at the final shot when it's scraping the top of it. So it's very, very obvious that there was no scale <laughs> at all. And we had drawn a, a scale chart of everything. We always did it for every show. And when it got to the the uh, whoever's doing the effect shots, uh, it would kind of depend on them what would happen. And so, uh, and the poor Santa Barbara guys, they were dying. They they hadn't had that much experience with this kind of stuff. And so you'll see some models that hadn't even been colored yet. They're still the, the render gray and they were fighting. They were just fighting for time and uh, they just weren't ready for it. So poor guys just were tortured 24 hours a day <laughs> until the movie came out. But that, that, that particular one was very, very big with not showing any type of scale whatsoever. When I went to Nemesis, I went to Digital Domain and uh, all those guys were very conscious of scale and direction and stuff. So uh, they made sure all of that stuff worked. And uh, it was it was awesome. Jay Barton was in charge of the the E model, so he built the computer generated model of the Enterprise E. And everything kind of scattered amongst the rest of his crew, but he was very conscious of what that ship was going to look like. Um, that one actually afforded, uh, from my point of view, a point to fix things that I didn't didn't uh, not that I didn't like, but I thought I could tweak or, or add a little bit of, of things. Because when we were doing the uh, first contact model, the big uh, the big model. Rick Sternbach did the plans, and before he finished the, the struts, he went on to another show. So he, his blueprints are only of the body, the saucer, and that's it. And so ILM made up the, the difference of the two. And when you see a profile of that ship, the nasals are very low, and the struts are very low. And so it, it, there was a flow in the, the designs that we were doing, and it kind of got lost. There's a kind of a notch, and then, then the nasals are too low. So they let me kind of correct that with, with Nemesis, and working with Jay was great. So. So good, which, good version, which version is this then? Yes, exactly. Is that too low, or, or is that the one you corrected? Uh, that model that you have there was actually they just kind of re uh, recast the uh, the uh, other models, yeah. and so uh, it it reflects the first contact view. It doesn't show the the nemesis corrections. Oh, it's good to know actually. Was, mm -hmm. there, was there any other subtle details you added? Maybe more torpedoes, maybe more... Well, the captain's yacht. I mean, was that in all three? I mean, were there any specific details that, that you added technically between the three versions? Yeah, all the, all the scripts called for something new. Yeah. And with uh, Insurrection, we had the, uh, the captain's yacht. And just ironically, the torpedo launcher, everything we needed was, was there accidentally. <laughs> so there are these little, little black uh, kind of rectangles that kind of... Uh, connect the torpedo launcher to the bay, and it worked out perfect to be the strut. So the only thing we had to do is kind of do an outline of where the nacelles would kind of tuck into the bottom of the uh, the saucer there. And that was the only change we had to do. We had to reroute the torpedo launcher because basically it fired right above the nose of the uh, of the uh, of the yacht. That and so dangerous. we came up with this re idea. So uh, the Cushman brothers had done this cutaway, and um, so I was trying to make their their drawing work as well. So we did a, a scenario where instead of the torpedo launching and shooting through a tube out that uh, torpedo launcher, we have it drop directly at the at the mouth of that thing where it would fire. So that sweep of the captain's yacht wouldn't interfere with the torpedo launcher. So everything would fit and correlate properly. And that was about the biggest change we had to do on um, insurrection. When it came to Nemesis, we were looking at the armament of the of the Enterprise, and it was all forward facing. Uh, 
phasers and, uh, and torpedo launchers. And the script called for mostly being attacked from the rear. So what we did is we added a whole bunch of strips and uh, rear torpedo launchers and on top of the ship as well on the bottom to compensate for what it didn't have earlier. So it would kind of progress as we went. Yeah, so I'm a really big fan of the EE. I think it's got an elegant yet aggressive sleekness that I think works really well. But obviously there are many concept designs that you had for the EE, and I want to get into one specifically than what's right next to us. It's got those thinner forward-facing nacelle struts, and I think you meant well, it's the one you mentioned earlier. Um, and mm. the uh, in the drawing that we've got, the nacelles are actually meant to go up and down like the, the Intrepid class or the Voyager. So talk us through some other concepts you had that maybe rejected, and then this one in particular. Yeah, with the, with the EE, I hadn't seen Voyager at that point. So it was just an accident, again, that that architecture kind of followed the Voyager with the sweeping uh, saucer doing more uh, uh, a forward-facing direction as opposed to wide. And um, when Rick came over, Herman knew this already, and so he just assumed that I was kind of connecting the two together and later came out and goes, oh, I thought you knew. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the Voyager was a whole different departure, but he had brought up at one point that the nacelles could move as well. And so we had it where the uh, where the struts would uh, be in their uh, their V position when they're flying, but they would lay flat, and the nacelles would hinge, so they wouldn't they wouldn't kind of rotate crooked. They'd always constantly in that uh, that upright position, so they would move unlike the Voyagers that were kind of attached. So they were more symmetrical and kind of that design flow work. But for the 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 E, we had to make sure that those would hinge, so they would move the whole time, kind of like a drafting arm. Uh, they felt it wasn't necessary. With the with the ship, so uh, it was it was an idea. So we, most of the stuff we do in the art department is to say yes or no to. And so when, after looking at it, you, go, you know it's not necessary. It's not story specific. We don't need it, and we'll just stick with what's been there before. That a stationary nacelle platform that doesn't move and is always permanently placed the way it is is, is the decision. Plus, it complicates the model build too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, another interesting with the E. It's the first Enterprise, I think, since Matt Jeffries that did not have the Aztec paint pattern on the saucer. And uh, we just never had time to draw, kind of draw that design. And so it came after the fact. We were going to do it in Nemesis. Nemesis wasn't originally supposed to be the last TNG movie. And so it was going to live again, and we were designing the Aztec paint job and all kinds of stuff for it that just never passed the drawing stage. But uh, it was going to get Aztec in the end. So were there any radical different variations to the e-design maybe early on that you just didn't that just weren't that just weren't said no to and you couldn't carry on on that you maybe wished had be on there uh. um the original ones we did a round saucer and we just thought maybe kind of fun to go back to that and it didn't it didn't work after having the d as as uh, kind of set in stone of what that kind of future architecture was going to look like so we went through changes from being a round saucer to being short to being long um some, some were actually extremely long, and uh, it just it just does, doesn't doesn't work. So that's why the sketches kind of come together. And we did this one profile that worked out. It had real sweet sleek lines, had the shorter nacelles. But Herman, I ran into Herman. He goes, "Yeah, I think that might be the idea to go." So we did just one more quick pass and uh, took it to, over to Mr. Berman, and he thought it was the right direction. So we started going with it. And there was always a time frame on these drawings, and he, Herman needed two color drawings real quick. So we just threw together. Two color drawings, they had nothing to do with what the E was going to look like, but it was an earlier sketch, and those just went over just as an appeasement. So uh, uh, those, those I've noticed get published a lot, but they really had nothing to do <laughs> with what the, what the vinyl design was going to be. They were earlier stuff that just didn't, didn't click. So, Well, as you mentioned earlier, that, that Nemesis wasn't supposed to be the last movie, and that you're, you're adding aztec and stuff to the Enterprise. Now, we know it got a major refit at the end of Nemesis with new color full plating. And mm -hmm. we've heard rumors about other changes that were planned. Now, do you know about any of the potential upgrades or changes that were going to be in the fourth gen uh, next generation movie? Uh, there was a lot of stuff that didn't happen. John Logan's script called for all kinds of stuff. The Scorpion fighters you see in the Nemesis. There's actually at one point where the Starship Enterprise had its own battleships in, in the hangars. And that was going to be a, a scene that uh, would give the Scorpion something to fight against. That, that scene went away. Uh, we didn't know that the movie was going to be the last one, but the executives did. And so that was news. We didn't realize that was happening until they were throwing the sets away, because they never throw sets away. So they had a bulldozer tearing them down, and uh, we go, uh-oh, something's not right here. We found out it was the last movie, and that's why we figured out most of the stuff was getting cut. So that was cut out. Um, uh, we were actually going to show the lower shuttle bay on the fuselage that you never see. That was going to be a big scene. So... Um, 
the upper deck where we're actually going to see the inside of it, the upper shuttle bay. So all the things you've never seen before, we were designing all of those things. Um, thankfully to the uh, ship's the line calendar, all that stuff kind of kind of lives. So you can see inside of the bay, you can see the fighters, you can see all that stuff that never came to be in the films. And what about in the fourth movie? What what we plan to go forward with? You know, extra. Oh, uh, the fourth movie, we didn't have any idea. We just uh, we just knew that we were doing stuff for Nemesis, and it would probably be uh, something we'd see in the fourth movie, but never went anywhere. So this is a Stuart question, but I've got it because it's my turn in the script. So, why did you choose to change the iconic deflector dish from blue to the yellowy orange? Uh, it's a big change, I John. Really, it's a big change. <laughs> I really didn't have anything to do with that, so uh, that kind of came out in the effects world. So, <laughs> so there you go. They chose the color on that one. Sorry to say, they had nothing to do with it. And before we go, here is the buck of the study model that we built for ILM. So uh, it's a pretty big model, it's all put together, it's about 32 inches. This particular one, if you can see, it has scribes and windows and details. And this was uh, when we built the first contact version for ILM, it was completely smooth, there was no detail at all. And uh, we go play it for the observation lounge. But when um, we needed a, a, a desktop model for uh, insurrection, we took it a little bit further, added the detail to it. And uh, this was the desktop model, wound up not being used or seen. Same as first contact, they're in there, but you never see them. And so uh, that was this one. And so when Nemesis came along, we brought that model into the director, had it on the set. He walks in and he goes, oh, wouldn't it be better if that was clear? And the, it, it was supposed to shoot, that set was supposed to shoot two days later. And they go, there's no way you can have that thing clear in two days. He goes, but how long would it take to make it clear? We go, well, probably about a month. And he goes, all right, we'll save this set and wait a month. And so we took that model, molded it. Gene Rosardi, uh, one of the model guys, took it and made this beautiful clear version, which again took forever because you have to use these platinum molds. And it came out tacky, just like the first contact Enterprise did. And so he wound up using regular molds, regular rubber molds, and it came out perfect. So that's where this came from. And you don't see it in Nemesis, but I think a fraction of a second. So all of that stuff for nothing. There you go. Well, he was funny the way he'd say that. So that we wanted to make T-shirts that said, make it clear. Uh, <laughs> we never got it. <laughs> so there you go. We didn't want to be fired. <laughs> All right, well, this has been a really fun episode for me. I love the Sovereign Class Enterprise, as do a majority of our fans. So I think this is going to be one of our favorite Trek Yards episodes for many of the fans out there. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today, John. My pleasure. Anytime. We look forward to many more episodes with you in the future, as you have been a very prolific, uh, very prolific in the world of Star Trek and have designed many, many great ships. Many, 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 many. <laughs> You just have to be at the right place at the right time. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it's been a great blessing to do it all. And I uh, had a great boss and uh, and all the crew. It was just a magical crew. So when you look at a ship and think it's something I did, it's usually collaboration. So a lot of hands behind the final thing. So uh, I've got to give a give a nod to Herman and Rick Sternbach and all the crew and all the effects guys. So And uh, I don't think I mentioned it, but what, what we would do when we draw things, I try not to make things completely finished because I want the next guy to be able to put his thoughts and ideas into it. So it's more collaboration as opposed to a, a one guy thing. So, so it's always fun to see what everyone comes up with. Excellent. Well, Samuel and myself, of course, would like to take, thank you guys, all the fans as well for tuning in. And we really enjoy producing these shows for you guys. We love this stuff and want to make content that we ourselves would want to watch, but it's not easy, and it takes well over 12 hours of production time for almost every episode from beginning to finish, polish episode. So if you enjoy seeing us every week and would like to help us out by contributing to the show, please do so by heading over to trekyards.com and clicking the donate button. We certainly appreciate all the help you can give. And of course, while there, please watch all of our past episodes. And don't forget to join us on Facebook as well and giving that like and subscribe button a click. Okay, until next week, trek on, guys. <laughs>